Welcome amazing agents and investors from across the country. Today is Wednesday, July 1st, 2020, and this is Role Play Call number 56. Before we get into the role plays, I, I want to congratulate. We had a contest going to get our Facebook group up to 10,000 members, and we are well over 10,000. We have two winners. John Barley was our 10,000th member to join the Facebook group, and Jonathan McGee referred 18 people to us. So congratulations to the John and John and Jonathan, the two Johns. You will be getting free leads in your market. If someone hasn't reached out to you already, uh, give customer service a call and let, let us know. So if any of you aren't members of the Facebook group, all the leads mastermind, just go there and request to join. If you are a legitimately a real estate professional, we will normally let you in. All right, let's go to the first person up this week. Uh, jump in, hit star six and hit one. There we go. We got a couple more volunteers. Next up is phone number ending in 3433. Three. You're up next. That's me. I'm here. That's me. Hey, Sam. how are you doing? Yay. I am doing great. great. Doing great. I have a, a, a question and then I'd like to role play it. I feel like, I like yesterday I just made 50 some calls and I feel like when I make my calls, I'm not confident enough and or pushy enough. I feel like when they tell me, hey, we've got that handled, you know, or my kids are doing that, I don't need any help, I'm, uh, I'm apt to say, okay, you know, hey, we're here when you need us, and then I'll call them back in two weeks to see how they're doing. But I, a lot of the role plays that I've listened to, that people somehow or another get to say, well, when, when can we make an appointment? You know, I'd like to get over and see you, and I'm not doing that. So I'd like to maybe have some coaching on when to do that. So I'd like you to hear me how poor and yucky I am. So, and then maybe we can switch and, well, you know what I mean? I, I know that I want to learn. And um, so the best way to do that is to open up and say, this is what I need help with. There was one that I heard, one um, uh, segment that you guys did where there was a coaching. He did like a 16-week coaching on how to talk to people and how you mirror them and when you acknowledge what they're saying. I, I, I put that in a support, your support thing to see if somebody could remember who he was. I unfortunately I was driving was and didn't get his name. Way back in 2014 when we had Joe Rico on our mastermind call, Jim. Look at you. You are oh, an yeah. amazing wow. individual. Joel, what's his last name? Joel Rico, Rico out of no Northern California, R-I-C-O, okay. J-O-E-L, -O R-I-C-O. He's in neurolinguistics okay. programming. He's an NLP expert, and uh, he did, gosh, it was one of our first mastermind calls. Well, I have been yeah. just, my goal is to do a mastermind call a day just to listen um, so while I'm getting ready and getting myself together, I listen to a mastermind call, and I'm really trying to learn so that, you know, I know that my my job is to call these people and get a, a an assignment, get a, a, a meeting together, and I've not yet done that well. So, so there's one thing the, I want to leave you way, with, and, and you can certainly buy Joel's course, but if, if you yep. have not read the book Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, you okay. Should, uh, I prefer the audio book. Um, it, it's yeah. It's very very well narrated. It's about seven and a half hours. It is. I will say dollar for dollar. It's the best damn money you ever spend in business. Like the okay. book will, and it's it it just helped me explain to other people what I was already what I was had learned. But it'll teach you about tactical empathy and how to how to use psychology to get the engagement you're looking for. That's that's one of the best books that I've ever read, and I've read thousands. So be sure and get okay. a copy of that for seven bucks. Okay. It's the best ROI that you'll ever have. Um, awesome. Yeah, I was not really interested in 16 weeks of training, but <laughs> yeah. I thought, well, if it if it helps us, then that's what we'll do. But uh, so um, Chris Voss has. You can buy his book. You can also go okay. to masterclass.com. He did a, and it's about it's a negotiation book, but not really. I consider it more of a sales okay. book. 
Um, but you can go to his. You can also buy his master class. I think master class is like a hundred bucks a month, and it's a subscription. You can, you know, but you can take it, do the course, and then cancel. But also, yeah. Chris has his own private coaching programs now. So like, you can do group coaching, or you can even have him come to you for fifty thousand dollars a day. Holy I think, crap! <laughs> yeah, the, the book will definitely definitely be a good place to start. And if you feel like you want, if you would just want more practice applying what you learn there, then you can yeah. do the master class or jump into his mastermind. Uh, Renee, one of our subscribers, she's she's actually been with his organization for quite a while now. It's That's some of the best sales content in the, out there. And the other thing oh, that that's extremely... Awesome an extremely useful resource and the last time I looked he was selling it for half price during COVID but Tony Robbins has a course I think he released it all the way back in like 2005 but it's just as relevant today as it ever was it's Tony Robbins Mastering Influence and it's normally 250 bucks again it's some of the best money you'll ever spend in your real estate career and it, it really just kind of like he really starts with the basics of identifying needs of people and how to meet those needs so it's like 12 hours it's designed to be listened to over 12 consecutive days mm -hmm. and I, again I would recommend buy the CDs they don't like they have you can purchase it in app but I'm not a big fan right. of their app I would suggest okay. buy the buy the actual CDs and then you can always rip them into mp3 files and put them on your phone sure sure but my kids also, would laugh at me if i bought it i bought a cd they would say mom nobody does that anymore <laughs> yeah. What's that? Yeah. but i i can i understand you're saying get them that way you've got it and i can rip it over so that i can listen to it from my phone or whatever that yeah. makes sense Jim, you know, we had um we had our whole sales team go through that uh never split the difference course and it was great they got a lot out of it but one very yeah. memorable thing that just did kind of jumped out at me is the point he made there is people love to say no, so let them say no and get it over with so you can get to the yes. So instead of calling mm -hmm. and saying, did I catch you, just very subtle things, did I catch you at a good time? And, you know, they they may say yes or no. Ask them right off, did I catch you at a bad time? And they can say no, which means it's a good time, and they got their no out of the way. <laughs> There's just so <laughs> many, so, so many very, I mean, it, it seems silly, but it's subconsciously yeah. very effective communication. Yeah. It really is. So, yeah, I... I that's highly what recommend I want to learn. Good, yep. I really want to learn that kind of thing. Well, do you want to role play? Awesome. Do you want to see how I do? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. All right. So I'm going to be me, and you can be the um, PR. Okay. Bruce, you want to take this one? Yeah, I got oh, it. That would. All right. Bruce, that would make me so happy. You know, Chad. You know, he's like the man. I could, I could go with you, and I'll feel a little less stressed. <laughs> <laughs> And Chad knows All right, how, to I'm be, ready. how to be extra hard on someone. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> oh, good, <laughs> good, good. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to really is, you know, you've got it taken care of. That's I want to learn and kind of pull that out of you. So, okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, you go ahead. Ring, later. ring. Okay, hello, this is Cindy. Can I speak with, um, what's your name? Um, Edward. Bruce. Bruce. Uh, Hi, Bruce. Yeah, yeah. How are you doing today? Um, I'm okay. Good, good. Bruce, hey, we got your name. We go down to the um, courtyard and or courthouse and get your information that you are actually the personal representative for Beverly. And I know that's a tough time, but I'd like to know if there's anything we can do to help you. What is the, the, the thing that you're really having the most trouble with? Uh, 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 you said your name is what again? Absolutely. My name is Cindy Kingery. And I work with Probate Home Services, and we, um, I just wanted to call and see how you're doing on the probate process. Uh, I, I, you know, Cindy, honestly, um, it's kind of a stressful time right now, and, and I, think we got, I think we got our probate stuff taken care of. Our attorney is doing a good job. Absolutely, and I, I understand that the attorney is necessary, and I'm really thankful you have that because he's going to be an asset, he or she is going to be an asset that, that you'll need, but we are here to actually help you. We help you with not only we can help you clean out the house, I can help you get um, an estate sale going. What are you um, really having difficulty with that's causing you the most stress? I uh, I, I don't know. We really haven't even gotten to that point yet, and I'm sure we're going to kind of have it taken care of. I've got family that's going to help out when we get there. 
Bruce, I am so thankful you've got family in that. Are you, um, are you the only one that's handling this? You said you've got family. Are they nearby? Are they out of state? Or are you kind of handling this on your own? Um, well, I got, I got my sister and, and her son, so my sister and, and nephew, and they live, they live here in, in town, and I'm sure they're probably going to help me on some evenings and weekends whenever they can get off work. Perfect. And a nephew is, is awesome because he's going to have good knees. He's going to be able to help you lift things and move things. But, um, and if you can get through that cleanup process, are you guys looking to keep the house? Are you, what are you thinking? What's your plan for the next stage? Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not sure we're really ready to make that decision yet. I, I, I think we're probably going to end up selling it, but I, I don't know when. We okay. really haven't talked about it yet. We're kind of not really talking a whole lot at this point. I understand. So, um, Bruce, you and your sister and your nephew, the plan is to get it cleaned out, right? And then you're going to look for things um, to do in the next stage. And a lot of times what we can do is come in during even when you're cleaning it out. We've seen hoarders' houses. We've seen beautiful houses. We don't care what the house looks like. We want to be able to get you to the next step. Would you be okay um, with us talking with you regarding that? Um, yeah, about the clean out. I mean, how much do you guys charge? What? We uh, actually – we. We don't charge anything, and I know you've got you and your nephew that's um, going to help you, but a lot of times families get together and they, they might make it two or three weekends, but then it gets really old with life. Um, so we have um, contacts, people that we um, can t get to talk to you to help you clean out. So basically we would be the in-between man, um, in-between person to say, you know, we have a, a great company. They're called Here to Help and they will come over and clean out the house. We also have an um, estate guy. His name is Adrian. He is the most amazing individual, has a history degree, and he can come in and tell you if things in the home are valuable. So we just have people that we can connect you with to um, be able to get your, you the most money that you can out of the house. Okay. okay, guys, here's where I would mess up. I feel like I pushed everything. <laughs> So I guess I want to break. Um, I feel like I don't know what to ask him yet. I, I, would end the, I would end the conversation and thank him and say, I'll call you back in two weeks, or where, where do I go from here? I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss. So um, here's, here's, here's what I have. I think that you want to do a little bit more information gathering on this call. Um, you okay. presented several different possibilities here. but. Um, you could dig a little bit more on family. So I, I mentioned that they'd come over on, on in the evenings, on weekends. Okay, so that's just a good opportunity to be conversational. And what, what kind of work do they do? Or what's your schedule look like? Are you, um, are you just as busy as they are? Dig a little bit okay. more and start to pull. You're going to pull a lot of information out as you dig and as you ask just some follow-up questions before you really get into your proposal. So um, okay. if you could extend a conversation like this by even five minutes, you're going to have so much information that you've written down, you're probably going to start to hear motivation. So when I said, you know, I'm not really even sure what we're going to do yet, I think we're going to end up selling it, um, this is where you might jump in and say, you know, in, in, in a perfect world, what would you rather do? Would you rather sell it soon or would you rather sell it several months down the road? and kind of start to pull that motivation out of the person that you're talking to. And then finally, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jim and Chad, see what they have. Finally, what I would also do is um, instead of trying to make proposals through the conversation, use the conversation as your information gathering. And then once you have enough information, okay. say, do you mind if I make a, a quick proposal to you? And they're going to say yes, especially if you've had them on the phone for 5, 10, 15 minutes. They're going to say yes. And then, okay. and then you take the information you've gathered and say, I have a clean-out crew and an estate sale company that really, um, for little to no money, we can get in there and get rid of anything that you and the family don't want. We can help you sell anything that you want to sell, give you the profits. Um, we can help you with your landscaping. 
all I need to do is maybe take a look at the house so that I'm making sure that I don't overcommit my team. Is, could you potentially meet on Tuesday and then I could just kind of show you the steps that I would take if I were you and see if that helps. See, that, so that's what I've never proposal. gotten to. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the conversation, once they've answered a lot of questions, a lot of questions they've given you information, you can make a more accurate and valuable proposal and they're probably going to be much more willing to hear that because um, you, you've been hearing them out for the, yeah. the first seventy-five percent of the conversation. When Jim, and I know you guys that have anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Oh. No, I just know right. that it is important to listen to them and important to re re say like I tried to put in that his nephew and sister and talk about you know, the fact that his nephew is young and, and helpful and that's important. And I, I want to be able to read, you know, um, I don't know what you guys call it, but um, to just bring that back into the conversation um, to make sure that they feel comfortable with me. So, but I've never gotten to the point, like you said, and maybe I'm, what I'm hearing you say is that I'm putting ahead of the listening, I'm trying to tell them that we can clean it out and we can do an auction and all of those things. I, and I should be just listening more and asking that that silence of asking a question and letting them answer. Is that what you're telling me? Um, yeah, asking questions, letting them answer. I like to ask questions with kind of binary questions where I'll say something like, um, is your attorney the type of attorney that, that agrees with being proactive? and has given you some things to do on the house while he's doing the legal side, or are you dealing with an attorney that just told you to um, sit back and let him do the legal side and then then deal with the house? Which okay. type of attorney are you dealing with? Or um, are you okay. guys thinking about holding on to the house as an investment, or are you thinking about selling it in the near future? And I'm letting them answer, and whichever answer they give me, there's always a good follow-up that you can say, okay, I completely understand. Tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, they're going to start to reveal more and more the deeper into that conversation you go. And and when I go back to my boss and he starts asking me all these questions like, well, what are they doing with this? What are they doing with that? And and I have ended the conversation before I even get all that. So he is kind of saying exactly what you are. Why aren't you getting more information from these calls? And I'm saying, well, I created a relationship. <laughs> you know, that's what it's all about. Is And I'll call him back in two weeks and – but I'm not getting anywhere with that. So mm -hmm. obviously I'm wrong. So I, I, I hear what you're telling me, um, and well, I want to do those well, things. What I would encourage you to do is just sit down, not in a script format, but list out um, the information that you would like to gather from people. And it's going to take some thought on your end. That you want to find okay. out, are they selling or are they keeping the house? If they're selling, are they selling soon or are they selling later? Um, is the house, do they have a lot of personal belongings in the house? Is it clean? Are they overwhelmed or do they have it handled? You just want to kind of get these um, uh, two sides of the coin answered where you know which side of the coin they're sitting on. And if you can write out 30 or 40 questions that you want answered, not in a strict way, all you have to do right. is just kind of check off or write the answer down in your conversation, the answer that they've given yeah. you so that you know and those naturally just lead to more questions and more conversation. But I think you need to start by listing off the questions that you want to have answered. Okay. And you okay, know, a, that makes sense a, decent, to me. a good place, a good template to start with is uh, in the fast track uh, program. There is Chad's interview After sheet, the third. seller interview sheet. Yeah. Yeah, e yep. exactly. You could start start with that and add your questions, you know, whether they're regular or binary. But it's a good a good a good document for you to start with and give you some ideas what, what kind of questions, you know, you want answered. Bruce, I like the idea of the um, the flip the coin. Do you want to sell it or do you want to keep it? If you know, be able to just have those two things that that pro and the con, you know, or not necessarily pro and con, but the both sides of it. So if I listed those down, I can know at least what they're going to say to me. And if they say that, what's my next? You know, what do I ask next? So that kind of sets me up a, a diagram, if you will. The other beauty of that is if they say. Um, hey, we're, uh, we got it handled. Let's say they say we've got it handled. Well, now that's conversational. It's not trying to blow you off and get you off of the phone. 
because you just asked yeah. the question. Are you guys stressed out or you feel like you have things handled pretty well so far? So if I say yeah. we have it handled pretty well so far, I'm not blowing you off. I'm simply answering a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and if they say they've got it handled, do I say, great, <laughs> we'll talk to you later? Or how do I, you know, if, if they've got it handled, what do I say? <laughs> Yeah, well, great. You know, I've had a lot of um, a lot of families that I've helped that uh, that had things handled for a while as well, and if, eventually um, you get to the point where um, you do maybe run into a block, or it is time to sell the house. By the way, did I ask you? Uh, I don't think I asked you. Did, uh, were you guys planning on selling the house, or are you planning on keeping it? Okay, awesome. So immediately, I've just validated them and taken them into another question. Yeah, that is incredible. Good, good. Okay, what do you guys have to say, Jim? Ready? Excellent job. You, no, I, th I think you were, you, I would agree pretty much uh, with what Bruce said. You seemed, uh, you certainly seemed confident. You were, you were conversational. Mm -hmm. But just ask more, ask more questions. I, I think that, that would be, we all have a tendency to try to ramble on and sell ourselves when, you know, maybe it's not even required. Just ask the right question, mm -hmm. and they may tell you. They may give you information on how to sell them before you, you know, before you get off track. Um, I like the word chatting um, proposal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I have a few suggestions. Chat. I would like you to go back and – sorry, I had to check and make sure I wasn't on mute. Um, I'd like you to go back and listen to the recording and notice in the beginning of the conversation you were nervous, and I'll show you, Grace, you're on a public stage role-playing. That takes courage. <laughs> but in your probate USP, you didn't believe yourself, and you stammered and said, we go to the courtyard, I mean the courthouse, and we, just, we, we got your information, and you weren't clear. And later in the conversation, when you started talking about your vendor partners and putting names and personalities and stories, like, oh, he's got a history yeah. degree, and he's like a wealth of knowledge, I could feel Bruce warm up to you. You got in rapport, but it was probably too late in a real-life scenario. So you need okay. to get that, that beginning of your, your – your, you'll hear me say it's about doing the right things in the right order. And it took you two to three minutes to get – to, to really unpack some of those things and, and be really personal. And you need to bring that stuff back to the beginning of the conversation. Um, okay. So, and that, that's, that's one thing. Like, I want you to get your USP down stronger. Who are you? How did you get their information? What value can you provide? And, and end with an open-ended emotional question. And you later in the conversation, you, you know, you explain to them more about it. But if you do that on the front, you're going to get engagement and rapport way quicker. Um, the next thing that I saw, Bruce, Bruce gave you, uh, he showed you a chink in his armor, and you missed it. And I want you to pay attention to these things. When, when you pick up the phone for every call, what is, your, what, is, what is the objective of a prospecting call? Well, for me, it's to help them, but I know that's wrong. It's supposed to be to set the appointment. To get face-to-face. So okay. in the back of your mind, when you're on any of these calls, I don't care if it's the first time you've spoken to them or the 14th, every time yeah. you're on the phone with these people, your only objective is to get in front of them. And obviously that means you have something of value and a good reason yeah. to be in front of them. So they're going to be helped. But I want you mm -hmm. to think about it in selfish terms. How do I get in front of these people? Because when you do, you're going to close. Like nobody's offering, very few people in the country offer service at this level. And it's, it, you have no competition if you can get face-to-face -face with these people. So that's okay. what I want you to think about. When you listen to the recording, the chink in the armor that Bruce showed you was, well, my, my sister and, and my nephew or my aunt and my nephew, whatever it was, that, that I, think, I think they're going to come over and help on nights and weekends. Boom. There's your entry point. Yeah. Oh, okay. It seems like you you guys don't really have a plan for that yet. And one of the things we see a lot of families, really mainly just because we all live busy lives, sometimes it takes two or three months and, and, and tensions build mm -hmm. and, and it gets kind of tumultuous. Um, other families we work with, they just say, hey, if you have a team to do this, we'll like it's all yours. And we'll actually come in and do the sale. We'll donate what doesn't sell, and we'll clean out what, what can't be donated. And literally the family never lifts a finger. 
Um, so if, if that's something we can talk about when, you know, once we've kind of taken a look at the property and we see what your overall situation is, that's one of the things that, you know, it never hurts to know what your options are. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. And yeah. I, get, I want to get, I want to get that affirmation from you. You can also use feel felt found, which is an empathy approach, yep. right? Uh, yeah. Listen, I understand how you feel. I mean, most of the families we've helped have felt the same way. But what they found is it's not always easy. It's kind of like herding, herding cats to get people to show up on a night or a weekend in the summertime, especially you know during during these times. Everything's a little more a little turned upside down and challenging. So, can you see how it might be in your best interest to at least have a contingency plan? And and I can get the history yeah. teacher to, or the, his, the history major to come over and and at least tell you what the personal property is worth. And then you know you already have that relationship. If you guys find yourself stuck or that family members are, aren't showing up or can't help, then all we have to yeah. do is go to plan go to plan B. Would that wouldn't that be wouldn't that make you feel a little more peace right now? So that and gives them like the ability that. to say, um, "Hey, I can try it." But if it, you know, because a lot of them are telling me, "Look, we're going to take care of cleaning it out. They, you know, we don't need any help with that." So. You know, I feel like okay, I, I understand. But if it and what I what I hear you say is that I can then offer that as a plan B. Hey, when you guys are done and yeah. you you know exhausted all your efforts, please come see us. We'll we'll be able to help you with that at at no little to no cost. And I want to that go back sense. to your the the preface that you gave us that okay um, what. I call this probate quicksand. Like when people are trying to do everything themselves, and I know that that there's a 90% chance they're going to be wrapped around the axle because that's that's just how it goes. Families think they can do a lot more than they can in, in a shorter amount of time than they actually can. So a lot of times they'll waste months, which equ usually equates to thousands of dollars of carrying costs. And sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. even if if the market's correcting, then it could be tens of thousands of dollars of equity. So you seem to be nervous about being a pushy salesperson. There is a massive difference between a pushy salesperson and a strong leader. And this is not a sales role. This is a leadership role. You get paid commission for bringing value. Think of yourself as a leader. You're a social leader in this situation because you don't have an emotional attachment to the real property, the personal property, or the people yet. Mm -hmm. So you can you can influence, you can lead and influence these families. You're not high pressure selling them. They always okay. have a choice, and you you never get paid until you do what you promise. So you, I think work on that mindset a little bit, and the result, you'll be more assertive because you know if you don't believe in your heart already, you need to get there, that these people are better off meeting you face-to-face -face than not. And you need to think of all of those reasons why they need you in their life. They need your business and your service to make life easier, to maximize equity, to minimize the time that this will take. And you have to believe that in your heart. And when you do, all this stuff starts to happen naturally. So there's some mindset things that I'd like for you to, to just kind of examine and think about. Um, and then go back and listen to this recording and look at your order. So when you say, we went down to the courthouse and got your information, it was very dry. Your delivery was poor, to be frank. But when you yeah. say things like, oh, my gosh, this estate sale guy, he's so good. He's a historian. He's got a history degree, and he just does this yeah. because he loves it. You personified him, right? And that's what yeah, I want you to do great. about the courthouse. So when you in your USP, it's like, oh, yeah, well, actually, we've got a team of people here in, in Roanoke that help families that are going through probate. And the way we find out which families need our help the most is we actually go meet with Kim Simmons, the probate clerk. Every month we go down there and she says, here are the families that you can help. And we, at the risk of offending some people, we get on the phone immediately and reach out because we know what a difference we can make in people's lives. We've seen what an impact we can have, how much money we can save a family, how much stress we can take away. So what's, mm -hmm. what's been the toughest thing for you guys? Mm -hmm. So it's just more personal. Like, and, and that's one of those things where you, in the beginning of the conversation, like we should be 80% listening, 20% talking. But in the very beginning of the conversation, you need to be heavier on talking because these people don't understand what your service is. They've never heard of it. Therefore, they probably don't trust it. So you have to, yeah. you have to kind of front load the conversation with, with talking 
and then in, then get those emotional questions out and then shut up. And that, then you're gathering information. So just like everything Bruce told you is spot on, like you, you need to give yourself more ammunition by, by learning more about the people and the situation. The segue to mm -hmm. real estate is incredibly easy. It's, you know, oh, it sounds like, you know, obviously you guys have a house to clean out. That's one of the biggest things that we see families struggle with. So let's, let's just start there since it's usually the biggest stressor. What, what's, your, what's your plan for it? Do you guys plan to, to hold on to it, keep it in the family, or do you think you might want to sell it? Yeah. And if they, want, if they want to hold on to it, then what's your angle? I think um, property, one ma of the property managers, contractors. One of the things people. that I feel, I feel on the call is I'm lying because I didn't go down to the courthouse. I've never been down to the courthouse. I don't yes, even know where the courthouse so is. Did you, give well, us, did you give us money? Yes. And did we give your money to a researcher that went to the courthouse? Did they physically yes, walk in I there didn't. and grab the lead? No, <laughs> I know. I know. Did. I just. Your I team think did. It's just I, like yeah, our team did. Now that I can say, that I can say, I just we are maybe an I need of to go. Yeah, I just don't like lying. But I I can say that I can say that my team did. That would well, give I'm me a little bit more confidence. I'm one of the most principled okay. people you'll ever meet. I, I speak the truth even when it gets me in trouble. So I understand. Yeah. But we are an extension of your team. You, we're a vendor. We're we're one of those spokes yeah. in your wheel. Because without that us, you have to go do a bunch of busy work that's well below your pay grade. So you're just wise enough, instead of going and struggling through your own data and skip tracing and all that, we are one of the yeah. team members. We help you find these families. So just think of it that way. We're a vendor. That makes sense. That I, that I, can, I can feel that. <laughs> I have one more question, and I, I know I've taken a lot of your time. I don't know what a USP is. You keep saying that. Oh, sorry. What is? You're, you, no, that's a unique okay. Selling prop, unique selling proposition. So it's essentially your elevator pitch. So the key points, the bullet points that, that I would suggest you just write down and keep in front of you is, yeah. Uh, the, so the, the 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 genesis of this was when I first started. I noticed all everyone had the same questions, which would put me back on my heels. Who are you? How did you get this phone number? Why are you calling? What is it that you want? Like, and they had me back on my heels, and I wasn't I wasn't in a leadership role. I was reactive. Yeah. So I learned to put all of that together. And, and what's the best way to defeat an objection? To never to let it arise in the first place. Yeah. Like, yeah. So you're proactively defeating three or four objections that will really derail your conversation. When they, when they get in that loop, like, how did you get my cell phone number? If you yeah. engage with that, you just gave them control of your conversation. So you want to make it a little fast-paced and front-load it with a lot of information so you've got them on their heels and you've got their gears turning and you're breaking their behavior patterns intentionally. Just like it's sleight of hand magic only works because they're masters of distraction and you don't notice okay. it. And that's the same tactic we're using that, that a magician uses is what we're using. By distracting them, we, we get get them out of their default mode network, like their, their patterns of thinking, and we're in control. And through showing them and in a good way, like there's a difference between manipulation and influence. And I'm talking about influence. So by by yeah. telling them really quickly, look, hey, my name's Chad. I've got a team of people here in Roanoke that help families going through probate. And as part of that, we actually go to the courthouse each month so we know who to reach out to. And we reach out early because we know it can make a huge difference for pretty much every family we've ever spoken to. So if there's one thing you could just make not your problem today and, and have us deal with it, what do you think that would be? So in their mind, the psychological response to that is first have to process everything I just threw at them, right? So now yeah. I'm, I'm, take, I'm taking a breath and waiting for the response. So now they're on their heels instead of the other way around. So they're right. thinking, all right, he said his name's Chad, and he, oh my God, he went to the courthouse, so that's how he got my phone number, and he says he can help with anything, any family with anything. Come on, that sounds too good to be true. I don't trust this guy. <laughs> Who is he? Oh, wait, he just asked me a question. What? And so there, you, you have control of their psychology, and it's a pretty okay. predictable response. When you do it this way, the response is predictable. Usually they will process, and you'll have silence. And what you'll learn in mm -hmm. Chris Voss's book is silence is, far more, is one of the best 
sales and negotiation tactic in the world. You have to know how to use silence to your advantage. And he who speaks first loses in this scenario. So get your USB mm -hmm. out, end on that question, and then be quiet. I don't. It, okay. it will feel like eternity the first few times you do it. Sometimes <laughs> it's a half second. Sometimes it's five seconds. But just be patient. Like don't when yeah. you set something up like this. Don't walk through your setup. Be silent and wait. Let them process, and then wait for their response. And the response is usually a sigh led by a big long story. And that big long story <laughs> is becomes your service roadmap. They are going to tell Absolutely. you all the things that bother them. You'll learn the fa family dynamic. You'll learn if you can usually learn if there's real estate or not. So rather than us having to pull information from them, we get we get them to a place where they can trust us and then they vent with their story and then we look for little things in there, little chinks in the armor where we're like, ooh, okay. They, 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 they think that the, the, the aunt and the cousin are going to come. I think they're yeah. going to come. So I need, I need to come back and talk about that. And, you know, the other things, like any, any details that you can get, just, just listen, listen, listen. And then the next listen time you better. speak, you, that's when you start validating their position, feel felt found. Think like if eventually when you get stories, you'll be like, oh, my gosh, you, this reminds me so much of my first conversation with the Smiths. The Smiths, like they had, you know, they, they lived out of town. Their parents still lived here, kept the place here, and they were really struggling with that. And you, it sounds like your situation is the same. What, what ended up happening with the Smiths is we stepped in and actually did X with, in a matter of days, and they had spent weeks trying to figure out just who to call. So do you mm -hmm. think that, that it might be in your best interest to at least have us come take a look and see if we can help with X before you waste all this time? And, and you then start that to bring to stories yeah. into it. Uh, but well, but I don't have stories same. yet. I, know, I don't I'm have saying, any I stories. Said, I said <laughs> I'm lying again. <laughs> no. Okay. Thank you so uh, much, guys. I appreciate you greatly. Thank you. Great job on stepping up. We had six people jump in the queue while while she was on, so I apologize in advance. I don't think we're going to get to you all. If we don't, and it's pressing, call us right away. If we don't get to you, and it can wait till tomorrow afternoon, come on the mastermind call, and we'll deal with it then. In the meantime, hey, next up, yes, sir. Hey, Jim. Gonna, yeah, you got to jump off right at three, right? Okay. Well, got I'm going to step out in two minutes and get set up for mastery, so I'll say goodbye to everybody. Thank you guys for a good call. All right. Next up is phone number ending in 6226. You're Chad's neighbor, it looks like, in Norfolk. <laughs> I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you great. Go ahead, Jim. Hey there. Um, my name's Patty, um, and I'm actually over in Virginia Beach. Um, I just had a quick question because I have to also go to Mastery. Um, my question is, so when I signed up, I signed up at the first week of June, and of course we're still waiting on our list for Virginia Beach. Um, but I actually purchased historical leads, so they're actually from February. So I sent out my first letter, and I'm getting ready to start making calls. So I just wanted to see if there was anything that I needed to change. Um, with um, my USP or anything like that, do you do anything different when it's been six months? You know, not necessarily. It you'd be surprised. It it varies from market to market, and and I, I Virginia has not. I believe that it it's just in the process of opening back up, so we should be getting you some new leads shortly. But if I had to guess on a six month old lead, maybe sixty to seventy percent of them might be listed or sold. But the 30% that haven't, you're going to have zero competition, and they're going to finally be ready to do something. I mean, if it makes you feel more comfortable, you could reference, hey, it, you know, it's been a while, but we actually find, you know, after six or seven months, a lot of people are ready to go ahead and get the property in the market. So I was just checking to see, do you still have properties to sell? You probably don't even need to reference it, but if it makes you feel more okay. comfortable to do so, do so, you certainly could. Bruce, anything okay. you want to add? Um, I mean, USPs are always. Yeah, I'm. I'm here. You got me. Yeah. Um, USPs yes, are always um, are always good. So you've sent your first letter. Um, this is this is probably a little bit more of an accountability or strategy call. Uh, but you've got your first letter, and you want to make sure that whatever that USP is on your letter and in your phone call, um, like Chad mentioned on the last call, is um, uh, brief and easy to understand. So okay. it could be make my team your team. Um, it could be uh, any kind of, uh, if you're offering any kind of guarantee or if your process nets them more money, anything like that, you want to push it front and center so that, okay. that it really grabs their attention. Okay. Um, and we can have another, oh. another chat off, off 
off this call as well. Okay. I'll, I'll oh, also, you can look at look at our website. One of our letters now is the six month letter. So, okay. if you're not using that letter, you certainly could, and you could maybe get some ideas out there also. You know, just okay. subtle differences, but not, nothing drastically different. Thank okay. Well, I went I went through the list and kind of went and looked up the property. Uh, there was like 112 of them, and I think there were like eight that were listed, sold, or pending. Um, so everybody okay. actually sent a letter. <laughs> so I just great, the great. Ones I knew already working with the realtor, and then I so I sent out I think 90 something letters. So I'm excited to start making phone calls. So, well, you know, you make a great point. You make a great point. The statistic I gave you of 60 or 70 percent being sold would be in a normal market. We've certainly been anything but normal. So a much larger percentage of them probably haven't done anything. Good point. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I'm headed to mastery. I appreciate y'all, and I'll talk to y'all next yeah, All right. Phone number ending in 6419. You're up. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Hey, Carlos. How's it going? Good, good. Hey, I have a question. I have been doing my calls, and I found out that the, um, the county administrator is, is sometimes uh, and in charge of the state, right? How, how do you approach them? Like, uh, what uh, what can you offer to them? Because I asked some questions in regards to so what's the biggest challenge that you face, like, when you're in uh, the administrator of the, of the state? And they say, well, we don't have any challenge right now. We, it's like uh, we sold the house as is. But what can what else can I offer them, like to to get referrals from there? So with public public administrators or fiduciaries, it's they're pretty much just um typically like the the relation the relationship with the public administrators or fiduciaries is very similar to the attorneys. So it's a B two B transaction for them, right? Like they're it's it's an unemotional. They they probably have you know they have systems in place to deal with this, but they they don't have a robust team like we have. Like they don't necessarily meet the family's you know personal needs. So one of the, one of a friend uh, a friend of mine that I'm mentoring into this he's potentially on I'd say he's on this call right now but you know Grant just made his first 15 phone calls and found a gentleman that that inherited he's, he has a condo in probate he was trying to refinance or finance it and you know he planned to stay in the property and those like Grant goes he went out of his way we found a lender that can do the condo financing right now and eventually he'll be the, he'll be the listing agent when that guy's ready to sell and so if you can go the extra mile these people probably don't have the bandwidth or the team to do that so if you can show them how your business can complement theirs and always have their their clients best interest first then it makes a big impression so when they really do need help you're the first person they call so focus on them and and their business where the, the, with the personal rep, we're focused on you know their personal situation and their personal problems. With the public administrators, focus on their business and the problems that business might have and just become the solution to those problems. So what happens when a public administrator finds a family that has a you know a, a kid that, that never flew the, never never flew the nest and they just don't want to participate, but the house has to be sold to settle the liabilities. Do they have a system in place for that? Do they have relationships with social workers? and, you know, moving companies and, you know, the housing authority? Probably not. A lot of times that falls falls back on the family to figure out their own problems. So anything like that that you can, any additional value that you can show them that they don't, they haven't thought of or, you know, that, that they just don't do because they can't monetize, that'll really solidify that relationship. And even if you don't get paid on this deal, the next, the next time they need help with real estate, you'll be their only phone call. I notice when I do the the, uh, the calls, I try to follow the the script, but I try to make it a more convinc- uh, more like a conversation with them. The only mm-hmm. thing is uh, stopping me from keep going is like uh, ask the emotional question that Chad say on, on the training. I miss in that part. Uh, I haven't just like practiced it enough to 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 nail it at, at the end of the conversation. You know. Yeah, so like a good a good ending question to your USP with a public administrator would be like, so Carlos, tell me, like I know you guys do this as a, as a as, you know professionally, but there's you know what we find is there's always things we would like to delegate. So if you could delegate anything on the John Doe case, what would that be? Like what what could I help you with? Okay, okay. Uh, well, we need a, a little bit of help in regards of. Uh, 
selling the property the way it is. So we don't have to deal with any other things like cleaning all the house. Just to say, a lot of times they actually do need help with with cleaning. So it's not um, it, it's not uh, like none of the services that you give a a regular PR. Um, it's not as though they don't apply to the public administrator. They still apply, um, but they they don't have that emotional need as as much as the, okay. as the um, PR has. So you can still tell them that you've got the team to help clean clean uh, clean the house out, to take care of property maintenance, landscaping, things like that. But you're you're gonna probably not be digging for their pain points because they just don't have those emotional pain points like like a PR does. And one oh, thing okay. that I was going to throw in throw in after what Chad said is a lot of times these guys need help. It's not like the only properties that uh, cases that they're fiduciary for are probate. They they might be the fiduciary on bankruptcies and guardianships and all kinds of things. Very frequently, they if they're going to need help, they need help with valuations of properties. So that's something that you could offer them uh, a free or a discounted BPO or an evaluation of their property um, to try to get your foot in the door with some of the public administrators. Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys for the advice. And I'm going to keep doing my calls and see how it goes. All right. Well, we appreciate you, Carlos. And next up is phone number ending in 0948. You're up next. I'm trying to build a team out so that that way I can be a resource for anybody that's going through probate. What kind of services would you guys recommend that is necessary, kind of, you know, like movers, attorneys, what other services would you guys recommend that we could have kind of in our Rolodex? So there, think of it as a wheel, and you have a hub and spokes that, that comprise that wheel. You're the hub, and there you can add a seemingly infinite number of spokes. Like in Probate Mastery, we teach like 36 different spokes, like 36 different team members, and show you how to what they can do for your team, like what value they bring to the table, and at least two ways to find each and every one of them. In a, in a natural role, in a, in a natural conversation, the reason I, I once said that is, is it's hard. Like you almost never talk about more than one or two. The idea okay. is to is to get engagement from them and, and pull out their needs, like bring their pain to the surface, bring their needs to the surface, and then just talk about the ones that are pertinent to the conversation to the, that really would have value. So if somebody doesn't have real estate, and then they don't need clean out services, and like yeah. you don't need to bring up everything. So there's never been a natural conversation where I've named off every single team member that I have. I as you. a basic list, as a basic list, you are you a broker, investor, or both? I'm, a, I'm an investor. Okay, so do you have an agent? As a partner, uh, do not have. A, we work with agents, but not specifically for this uh, campaign for probate. Okay, you should choose one, maybe two, but choose an agent that understands your business model. They understand when when to, to to back off and let you take a deal, and when they need to step in and be the listing agent. Um, ideally, okay. you should you should get your license and, and be that spoke because you're going to make a, a a lot 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 more money over your career. But for now, you need as your basic team. You need a, you need a good brokerage partner. You need a good contractor, okay. clean clean out crew, estate sale company, um, potentially se senior moving companies. And then you build a referral network. So you need estate planning attorneys or pro estate planning slash probate attorneys, um, nursing home employees, social workers, people who have contact with families who are going through this transition that can, can refer you. And awesome. so th they're team members, they're vendors, but they're also referral partners. Um, and if, if you want to, you know, the long form of that is in mastery. But if you want to role play, I'll kind of show you. Like I always choose to show them the the spokes that are relevant to them based on the details I've gathered from the conversation. Okay. You never just un unload and say, "Here's all the pe here's all the people you, the, you know, you the, can do the team members we have." Okay. Yeah. I hope that helped. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much. Phone number ending in nine eight seven seven. You're last up this week. Well, I'm glad I squeezed in. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. Just, uh, just under the wire. Yeah, I always. It's usually that way. No, the question that I was wanting to ask was: um, This is uh, the first time I've been able to make one of the meetings 
What is a uh, what would be a good uh, support team list that you would suggest? Because you um, role playing, you were talking about uh, the estate um, sales auctions and cleanup. So, what would be a basic uh, a team that you would have on standby? Chad's done a tips for the trainer on that. We actually have a brochure with a wheel on our website. It'll take you to. I mean, your basics are, of course, realtor, investor, estate sale company, clean out crew, contractor, attorney. But I mean, from there, you know, there can be. There could be another 20 spoke estate planning attorney, someone to prepare a will for them. It's all there on the website. I would go to, uh, I think there's a tip for the trainer's session where Chad goes over that specifically, and you can actually watch that video. That'd probably be the easiest way for you to, to get everything you need. Okay. Okay. Chad, Bruce, you want, you want to add to that at all, Bruce, or no? I mean, you could literally sit down and come up with 40, 50, 60 partners that, that could be with you on this business based on how detailed you want to get with them. Yep. You should have your list. And, and so that if you ever offer, say, make my team your team, and someone says, well, who is your team, at least you can come up with 10 or 15 people at, at bare minimum. Um, contractors, different different specialists, so electricians, plumbers, uh, house, house cleaners, landscapers. There's so many people that you could use. Right. Yeah. Okay. And one, I often feel when we talk about this that we somewhat overwhelm people and don't make the mistake of thinking – you have to have everybody before you do anything because, honestly, um, probably I would say 75% of the people, 50 to 75% of them, aren't going to need any of them or they're going to need one of them. It's really rare that anybody's going to need more than one or two or three. But, but the fact that you have them really distinguishes you from your competition. You know, and when, and when the people do need it, I mean, you're the only one they even consider. Bruce, in your in your experience, how many people even take advantage of one of your team members, and how many of them just say, "Sell the property, I'm ready." So it kind of goes back to what um, Chad was talking about before he jumped off: is taking charge. And uh, this right. goes, goes along with me. A lot of times, I don't wait for people to say, "Oh yeah, I need someone to clean my gutters out." They're not going to say that. So I gather enough information, and then I'll say, um, I, I'd, "I'd like to make you a proposal, if possible." And they, they because we've had a good conversation, they say, "Okay." And I say, "It sounds to me like you've just kind of un- unfortunately been neglecting the outside because your 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 dad was sick and you've been super busy." And I imagine that at this time of year, the gutters are probably full, and you got weed coming through the flower bed. And, you know, I'd like to um, come over and take a look at the house, and I can get you a gutter cleaner over there, and I can get you a landscape. Uh, landscaper over there within a couple of days. These are people that are part of my team, and um, but I just need to take a look at the house first. And so I'm taking charge and actually recommending the services that they need that they're not even thinking about. So no, right. they're probably not going to ask for those team members. But if you right. have the team members, you can take charge and turn these into referral opportunities without them asking. And whether they use them or not, again, it just it just really makes you stand out from anybody else they're going to be talking to. Mm-hmm. It'd be virtually very unlikely anybody else is going to offer them other, anything other than, hey, I'm the greatest realtor in the world. Look at me. Look at me. I can sell your property. And you're pretty much just doing exactly the, the opposite. <laughs> exactly. I'll put aside the art, put the MLS for you. Well, that's very unique. Anyway, welcome wow. to the group. We appreciate your participation. Does that help? Yeah, that does help. I actually uh, picked up a house in February that was a foreclosure, and we ended up up doing all the uh, moving for her because she's in her late 70s so I'm not a stranger nice. to it but sure. the uh, sure. that also brought up another question was if the um, if you're referring these uh, contractors to do the work um, on the back office am I working a referral with the uh, with the vendors or is there and um, they getting paid by the estate because a lot of the people that I'm dealing with they just don't have the money to to uh, pay for anybody to come in if you have people that will wait till closing to get paid that's the ideal situation. Um, you should. This isn't like an REO where you should have to pay advance the money. We do have people that have done it, and you know, if you got a secure listing and you're sure it's going to sell, and it's a hundred dollars for landscaping, you you may want to lay the money out. But most of the time, you're just a referral source. You know, not too different from standard transaction when you refer a you know a mortgage broker, a termite company, a roofer. You know, they they don't expect you to pay for it, or they don't expect you know you to collect the you know collect the money and pay for it. it generally, m- most of the time, it's just a, a straight up referral. And as far as I'm not sure if you asked this, but as far as getting a referral from these people, you really don't need to, and it just complicates the issue. We would rather have you 
have a reciprocal arrangement with them. Hey, I'm going to be sending you business. You're going to have people contact you first, especially the estate sale companies. They have people call them and, hey, I need to get rid of this stuff before they ever contact a realtor. So let them know that quid pro quo, I'm going to send you business and I expect to get referrals back from you also. <laughs> right. Okay. And, All and right. So well, that ties me over for now. One of the things that I do with a lot of my vendors is I do, I, I don't necessarily come out and say quid pro quo because that seems to be a taboo subject right now. But uh, <laughs> um, we, Different verbiage. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I do, um, I, a lot of times I'll put vendors into a mastermind group specifically around probate and say, hey, we're going to have a 30-minute Zoom call. We're going to help each other's businesses, and ultimately we're going to work together. Um, personally, I've actually even gone as far as to charge a small fee to be in my mastermind group and then use that to put toward my probate business. Some people aren't comfortable with that. Some people are. And then I make sure that every month all of my partners are sitting in a room together. And then when I'm using that opportunity, especially on the phone during, um, during the phone conversation, to tell people, you know what, I, I don't know what your situation is. I don't know if the estate can afford a few of the suggestions I'll make or not, but I'm still going to make them, and it will be up to you guys to decide whether you want to handle those on your own, whether you want to work something out with me, or whether you want to hire those projects out. But I guarantee you, if you, if you follow the plan that I'm just going to give you for free when we meet on Tuesday or Wednesday, that, um, that you're actually going to make – more of a profit, more money into the estate, and not give up so much of your equity. And then it's not up to you to decide whether they hire someone or use your referral partner. It's up to you to give them the plan and then give them the option of the referral partner. And if they want to do that work themselves, great. At least now you're getting in front of them and you're able to look at the real estate. Proximity. Yep. Great idea. Okay, All right, good. sir. That help? Yeah, that does help. All right. Great call, everybody. We appreciate great attendance. I want to thank each of you for being here. I want to particularly thank those who actively participated and role-played. And I want to challenge each of you, take one of the great ideas that you heard on today's call, go out and put it into practice, and actually come back tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern on our mastermind call and share the results with the group. Thank you so much, guys. Make it a great day. Stay healthy, and we will talk to you tomorrow. Take care.